the order for morning prayer daily throughout the year. With the Lord before us, who could be against us? Let us confess our sins, Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we've erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We've offended against thy holy laws. We've left undone those things which we ought, not, ought to have done and not done things we ought to have done. And there's no health in us apart from your grace and strength and renewal and regeneration. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of his people, but that they, they should turn from his wickedness and live, has given assurance that he pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us ever beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O come, let us worship, sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. We show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the day of, temp day of provocation, temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with that generation and said, it is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways. And to whom I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Now we turn to our lections and our studies of God's Word. We're turning now to the fundamentals in an article by Dean Dyson Hag of Wycliffe College, commenting on higher criticism. Like many physical scientists, they are so preoccupied a theory of their own 
that their conclusions seem to the average mind curiously warped. In fact, a very learned man in a letter to Descartes may once made an observation which, with slight alteration, might be applied to some German critics. When, quote, when men sitting in their closet and consulting only their books attempt disquisitions into the Bible, they may indeed tell how they would have made the book if God had given them the commission. This is, they may describe the chimeras which correspond to the fatuity of their own minds, but without any understanding of the div truly divine, they can never form such an idea as to themselves. If, says Matthew Arnold, you shut a number of men up to make study and learning the business of their lives, how many of them, from want of some discipline or other, seem to lose all balance of judgment, all common sense. The learned professor of Assyriology at Oxford said that the investigation of the literary source of history has been a peculiarly German pastime. It deals with the writers and readers of the ancient Orient as if they were modern German professors and the attempt to transform the ancient Israelites into somewhat inferior German compilers proves a strange want of familiarity with the Oriental modes of thought. Sasa, early history of the Hebrews. Anti-supernaturalists. In the third place, the dominant men of the movement, movement were with strong bias against the supernatural. This is not an ex parte statement at all. It is simply a matter of fact, as we shall presently show. Some of the men who've been the most distinguished as leaders of the higher critical movement in Germany and Holland have been men who have no faith in the God of the Bible and no faith in either the necessity of the possibility of personal supernatural revelation the men who've been the voices of the movement, of whom the great majority, less widely known and less influential, have been mere echoes. The men who manufactured the articles the others distributed, which have been notoriously opposed to the miraculous. We must not be misunderstood. We distinctly repudiate the idea that all the higher critics were or are anti-supernaturalists. Not so. The British American school embraces within its ranks many earnest believers. What we do say, as we will presently show, is that the dominant minds which have laid in, led and swayed the movement who made the theories that the others circulated were strongly unbelieving. We turn now to Haley and the habit of Bible reading. Everybody should love the Bible. Everybody should read the Bible. Everybody. It's God's word. It holds the solutions of life tells about the best friend humanity ever had, the noblest, the kindest, truest man who ever walked on this earth. It is the most beautiful story ever told. It is the best guide to human conduct ever known. It gives meaning, a glow, a joy, a victory, a destiny, and a glory to life. There's nothing in history or in literature that in any way compares with the simple record of the man of Galilee who spent his days and nights ministering to the suffering, teaching human kindness, dying for human sin, rising to life that shall never end, and promising eternal security and eternal happiness to all who will come to him 
most people in their serious moods must have some question in their minds how things are going to stack up when the end comes. Laugh it off and toss it aside as we may. That day will come. Well, it is the Bible that has the answer. And an unmistakable answer it is. There is God. There is heaven. There is hell. There is a Savior. There will be a day of judgment. Happy is the person who in this leaf makes his or her peace with Christ of the Bible and gets ready for the final takeoff. How can any thoughtful person keep his or her from warming up to Jesus Christ and the book that tells about him? Everybody ought to love the Bible. Everybody. Everybody. Yet the widespread neglect of the Bible by the churches and by church people is simply appalling. Oh, we talk about the Bible, defend the Bible, praise the Bible, exalt the Bible. Yes, indeed, but many church members seldom ever look into the Bible. Indeed, would be ashamed to be seen reading the Bible. And an alarming percentage of church leadership generally seems to be making no serious effort to get people to be Bible readers. We're intelligent about everything else in the world. Why not be intelligent about our religion? We read newspapers, magazines, novels, and all kinds of books. We listen to radio and watch television by the hour. Yet most of us do not know the names of the books of the Bible. Shame on us. We're still the pulpit which could easily remedy the situation. Seems often to not care and generally does not emphasize personal Bible reading. Speaking of Bible reading, we are with in Psalm 27, verse 3. If there should encamp against me a camp, my heart shall not fear. If there should rise against me war, in this I shall have confidence. He infers from former experiences I've already mentioned that whatever adversity may fall him, he ought to hope well and to have no misgivings about divine protection, which had been so effectually vouchsafed to him in his former need. He had asserted this indeed in the first verse, but now upon further proof of it, he repeats it. Under the term camps and armies, he includes whatever is most formidable in the word world, as if he'd said, although all men should conspire for my destruction, I will disregard their violence because of the power of God, which I know is on my side. My heart shall not fear forever. This does not imply that he would entirely be devoid of fear for that would have been more worthy of the name of insensibility than of virtue. But lest his heart should faint under that which he encountered and has opposed to them the shield of faith. Some transfer the word translated in this to the following verse, meaning that he was confident that he would dwell in the Savior's house. But I am of the opinion that it belongs rather to the preceding. Let me turn now to Noah. The flood came in Noah's 600th year, increased steadily. 40 days, maintained its mountain covering depth for 110. We read this. And the Babylonian flood account, the Gilgamesh epic, Noah's counterpart is Utnapishtim, 
he likewise received divine warnings of the flood, built a huge ark, and preserved human and animal life, sent out birds and offered sacrifices. However, the gross polytheism and absurdity of the Babylonian account demonstrate that it suffered from a long oral transmission and that it did not influence Gen Genesis in any way. No, one of the five daughters of Zelophehad, the tribe of Manasseh. That's a different Noah. Let me turn now to Leviticus. These trends can be discerned in several different areas of religious life. First, there's the question of the place of worship. In the days of Samuel, there was freedom to sacrifice wherever one chose. King Josiah, however, limited all sacrifice to the temple in Jerusalem. Leviticus simply assumes that all sacrifices must be offered in the tabernacle. According to most critical scholars, the tabernacle and cult described in Leviticus are projections into the mosaic part, uh, mosaic past of the temple in Jerusalem. That Leviticus simply assumes that all sacrifice will take place in the tabernacle, for example, the temple shows that Josiah's centralization and measures have been had been universally accepted having occurred long before P would have been written. We turn now to Genesis, I believe we are in chapter 18. We finished the covenant of 17 and now 18, the visit of Jehovah with the two angels to Abram's tent. Having been received into the covenant with God through the rite of circumcision, Abraham was shortly afterwards honored by being allowed to receive and entertain the Lord and two angels in his tent. This fresh manifestation of God had a double purpose. To establish Sarah's faith in the promise that she would bear a son in her old age, verses 1 to 15. And to announce the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, verses 16 through 33. Verses 1 to 15. When sitting about midday in the grove of Mamre, in front of his tent, Abraham looked up and unexpectedly saw three men standing at some distance from him, above him, looking down upon him as he sat, namely Jehovah, and two angels, all three in human form. Perceiving at once that one of them was the Lord, Adonai, he prostrated himself reverentially before them and entreated them not to pass by him, but to suffer him to entertain them as his guests. Let a little water be fetched, and wash your feet, and recline yourself under the tree. Comfort your hearts, strengthen the heart, refresh yourselves by eating and drinking. For therefore, give me an opportunity to entertain you hospitably, if you come over to your servant. Verse 6. When the three men had accepted the hospitable invitation, Abram, just like a Bedouin sheik of the present day, directed his wife to make three seahs of fine meal and bake cakes of it quickly as possible. He also had a tender calf killed and sent for milk and butter or curdled milk, and thus prepared a bountiful and savory meal of which the guests partook. 
eating of the material food on the part of these heavenly beings was not in appearance only, but in really eating. An act which may be attributed to the corporeal corporeality assumed and is yet to be and is to be regarded as the ana analogous to the eating on the part of the risen and glorified Christ although the miracle still remains physiologically incomprehensible verses 9 to 15 during the meal at which Abraham stood and waited upon them as a host they asked for Sarah for whom the visit was chiefly intended. Now we turn to the book of Judges, chapter 10. We've been talking, 10, 6 to 16, talking about Tola and Jer. This section forms an introduction not only to the history of Jephthah, and the judges who followed him, Ibsen, Ellen, and Abdon, but also to the history of Samson, who began to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. After the fact has been mentioned in the introduction that Israel was given up into the Philist unto the Philistines and Ammonites at the same time, the Ammonitish oppression, which lasted 18 years, is more particularly described in verses 8 and 9. This is followed by the reproof of the idolatrous Israelites on the part of God. And lastly, the history of Jephthah is introduced in verses 17 and 18, the fuller account being given in chapter 11. Jephthah, who judged Israel for six years after the conquest and humiliation of the Ammonites. It was followed by the judges of Ibzon, Ellen, and Abdon, who judged Israel for seven, ten, and eight years respectively. So that Abdon died 49 years after the commencement of the Ammonitish oppression, nine years after the termination of the 40, 40 years rule of the Philistines over Israel, which is described more particularly in chapter 13 for the purpose of introducing Samson, who judged Israel 20 years under that rule without bringing it to a close or even surviving it. Verses 6 to 16. I mean. In the account of the renewed apostasy of the Israelites from the Lord, contained in verse 6, seven heathen deities are mentioned as having been served by the Israelites in addition to the Canaanitish Baals and Ashtart, the gods of Amram, that is of Syria, are never mentioned by name of Sidon, according to 1 Kings 11, principally the Sidonian and Phoenician Ashtart of the Moabites, Chemosh, and principal deity of that people, which was related of Mo to Molech, of the Ammonites, Melcom of the Philistines, Dagon. If we compare the list of these seven deities with verses 11 and 12, where we find seven nations mentioned out of whose hand Je Jehovah had delivered Israel, the correspondence between the number seven in these two cases and the significant use of the number are unmistakable. Uh, good morning, Mary. Good to see you again. We're still in Isaiah chapter 1, uh, 10 through 16, on the advancement of the Messiah's kingdom in Hezekiah's time, after the explicit messianic promises of 
Isaiah 11, 1 to 9. He, that is the Messiah, shall stand for a symbol or an ensign to the people. When he was crucified, he was lifted up from the earth. He's, Prof. Henry's taking a little detour here. That he might draw the eyes and the hearts of men unto him. He is set up as a symbol and ensign in the preaching of the everlasting gospel, which the ministers as standard bearers display the banner of his love to allure others to him, the banner of his truth under which we may enlist ourselves and engage in war against sin and Satan. Christ is the ensign to the children of God that were scattered abroad and gathered together. And to him the Gentiles shall seek. We read of the Greeks that did so in John 12. And upon the occasion Christ spoke of his being lifted up to draw all men to him. The apostle from the Septuagint is from the apostle in the editions after Christ we read in Romans 15 12 in him shall the Gentiles trust and that's the essence of Acts chapter 2 turning to the New Testament and the article on Jehannan theology and we've been talking about the Logos doctrine. Thus John teaches, and the Logos as understood more from the wisdom literature than from philonic concepts of Platonic philosophy. Jesus is identified with the Logos of God, the creative and revealing word who existed from the beginning with God and was God who became man. Despite the claims of Ernst Kossemann, John does not fall into a naive docetism. The real manhood of Jesus is a cardinal point of Johannine Christology. Not only does the gospel describe a real man who could be hungry and thirsty, but in 1 John, utmost importance importance is attached to the coming of Jesus by water and by blood in a true and lasting incarnation. Men were able to see, hear, and touch him, 1 John 1. John thus emphasizes the coming of the Savior from beyond space and time and the reality of his coming into this world. History is of crucial importance to him. C. Hoskins. And now for Professor Jameson, uh, Matthew ten thirty six. With Jesus doing miracles. When he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they fainted. This reading, however, has hardly little authority at all. The true reading, doubtless, is they were harassed. Um, see, I found a nice set of four volumes of West's worst word studies as I gear up to study some New Testament books. Well, I'm glad you got that. That's a good set. Um, don't hear much of West these days, but it's a good, good set. Got them up in over here somewhere. Been a while since I've been in West, but very helpful and very good to see scholars. I mean, he's from a different generation, but it's so wonderful to be refreshed by them and their commitment to God's Word. We read the Bible ourselves, but also we have other voices that we listen to in the seminar room, so to speak. Back to Prof. Jameson of Glasgow. And were kept scattered abroad, lying about, abandoned, as sheep having no shepherd. 
their pitiable condition was wearied and couching. But they were in bodily fatigue, a vast disorganized mass, being but a faint picture of their wretchedness as the victims of Pharisaic guidance. Their souls uncared for, yet drawn after and hanging upon him. This moved the Redeemer's compassion. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous. His eye doubtless rested immediately upon the Jewish field, but this he saw widening into the vast field of the world, teeming with souls to be gathered to him. But the laborers are few, men divinely qualified and called to gather them in. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, the great and proprietor of them all. I am the true vine, my father is the husband. And pray that he will send forth labors into the harvest. The word akbale properly means thrust forward. But this emphatic sense disappears in some places. And then we will pick up with Matthew 10, 1 to 5. And now for Acts chapter 1, 15 through 26, as the disciples remain huddled, 120 of them, after the ascension and before Pentecost. The fulfillment, he's been talking about Judas, the fulfilling of the scriptures in this, which had spoken so plainly of it that it needed to what must needs be fulfilled. Let none be surprised nor stumble at it that this should be the exit of one of the twelve. For David had not only foretold his sin, which Christ had taken notice of it, conferred John 13, 8, where he gave indications of that in the Last Supper. From Psalm 6, I think he's got this wrong. Psalm 41, 9, no, that's correct. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me, but also foretold his punishment. This is the one I'm remembering, Psalm 69, 25. Let his habitation be desolate. This psalm refers to the Messiah. Mention is made but two or three verses before of giving him gall and vinegar. Therefore, the following predictions of the destruction of David's enemies must be applied to the enemies of Christ and particularly to Judas. Perhaps he had some habitation of his own at Jerusalem, which upon this every body was afraid to live in, and so became desolate. The prediction signifies the same with that Bildad concerning the wicked man that his confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle. He shall bring him to the king of terrors. He shall dwell in tabernacle, because none of the brimstone shall be scattered upon his habitation. And we turn now to Prof. Hodge on Romans 7, 1. The apparent confusion in this passage arises from the apostles not carrying the figure regularly through. As a woman is free from the obligation to her husband by his death, so we are free from the law by its death, is obviously the illustration intended. But the apostle, out of respect probably for the feelings of his readers, avoid saying that the law is dead, but expresses the idea that we are free from it by saying we are dead to the sin by the body of Christ. Commentary, verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how a man 
how the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. In the English version of the words he, a agnaite, the particle a is overlooked, as that particle is almost always used in reference to the immediately preceding context. Meyer and others insist on connecting this verse with 623. The gift of God is eternal life, or are ye ignorant? That, that is, you must recognize eternal life as a gift unless ye are ignorant that the law does not bind the dead. But this is evidently forced. The idea which A is used to recall is that of 614. You're not under the law, but are under grace. This is the main idea in the whole context, and is that which in the following passage carries out and enforces. The thing to be proved is that we are not under law. The proof is that the law does not bind the dead. But we are dead, therefore we are free from the law. This idea that the law binds a man only so long as he lives is presented as a general principle and is then illustrated by a specific example. That example is the law of marriage, which ceases to bind the parties when one of them is dead. So the law as a covenant of work ceases to bind us when death has loosed its bounds. We are free as a woman whose husband is dead. He speaks as to his spiritual brethren and not to Jew Jewish converts alone. For I speak to them that know the law. That is, I speak to you as persons who know the law. Not I speak to those among you who know the law. He does not distinguish one class of readers from another. That would require the article in the date of Tog and Oskusi to the knowers, as opposed to those among them who did not know. He assumes that all his readers were fully cognizant of the principle that the law has dominion over a man so long as he lives. What law does the apostle here refer to? It may be understood of law without restriction. Law, all laws, bind a man only so long as he lives. Or it may mean especially the Mosaic law. We'll pick up that rather wonky exposition tomorrow as we turn to philosophy and the atomists and Lucippus. We're nearly to a summary of these pre-Socratics. However, what, whatever way the atoms originally moved in the void, at some point of time collisions between atoms occurred. Those of irregular shape became entangled with one another and forming groups of atoms. In this way, the vortex of Anag Anaxagoras is set up and a world is in process of formation. Whereas Anaxagoras thought that the larger bodies would be driven, driven furthest from the center, Leucippus said the opposite, believing wrongly that in an eddy of wind or water, the larger bodies tended toward the center. Another effect of the movement in the void is that the atoms, which are alike in size and shape, are brought together as a sieve brings together grains of millet, wheat, or barley, or the waves of the sea heap up together long stones with long and round with end. This way are formed the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water. Thus innumerable worlds arise from the collisions among the infinite atoms moving in the void. It's quite noticeable that neither Empedocles forces love or strife, nor the noose or mind of Anaxagoras appear in atomistic philosophy. 
Leucippus evidently did not consider any moving force to be a necessary hypothesis. In the beginning existed atoms in the void, and that was all. From the beginning arose the world of our experience, and no external power or moving force is assumed as a necessary cause for this primal motion. Apparently, the early cosmologists did not think of motion as requiring any explanation. And in the atomist philosophy, the eternal movement of the atoms is regarded as self-sufficient. How very modern. Leucippus speaks of everything happening at Lagu Kaiupapukes. A non case that is by the word and by necessity in translation, and that this at first sight might appear inconsistent with his doctrine of the unexplained original movement of the atoms and the collision of the atoms. The latter, however, occur necessarily owing to the configuration of the atoms and their irregular movements. To us, indeed, it may well seem strange to deny chance and to posit an eternal, unexplained motion. Aristotle blames the atomists for not explaining the source of motion and kinds of motion. But we ought not to conclude that Leucippus meant to ascribe the motion of the atom to chance. To him, the eternal motion and continuation of motion required no explanation. In our opinion, the mind boggles at such a theory and cannot rest content with Leucippus's ultimate. But it is an interesting historical fact that he himself was content with the ultimate and sought no first unmoved mover. You can see how that is going to affect and influence someone like Thomas Aquinas with his affection for Aristotle. And we turn now, or I believe we're finishing, or are finished, uh, the summary on canonic theory. Canonic theology, which tries to explain how the two natures of Christ cohere is in reality a variant, but a new form of orthodox biblical faith. It has appeared in a variety of forms over the last century, it's been vigorously debated, and interest in it remains. From one angle, it can be seen as an attempt to give conceptual substance to the great hymn of Charles Wesley, that speaks in awe that the son would empty himself of all but love and die for a fallen humanity. From another angle, canonic theology represents an attempt to give a central place to Jesus' limited yet sinless humanity, while affirming that the ultimate significance of that humanity was and is that here on earth God this eternal son has come truly to redeem. Well, and we turn now to Charles Hodge, who's on a teleological argument, which he's just begun. Teleology, by design, is intended. One, the selection of an end to be attained, two, the choice of suitable means for this attainment, three, the actual application of those means. Such being the nature of design, purpose, it is a self-evident truth or even an identical proposition. That design is indicative of intelligence, will, and power. It is simply saying that intelligence in the effect implies intelligence in the cause. It is moreover true that the intelligence indicated by design is not in the thing designed. It must be an external agent. 
the mind indicated in a book is not in the book itself, but in the author and printer. Intelligence revealed by a calculating machine, where any similar work is not the material employed, but in the inventor and artist. Neither is the mind indicated in the structure of the bodies of plants and animals in them, but in him who made them. And in like manner, the mind indicated in the world at large must be an extra mundane being. There is indeed this obvious difference between the works of God and the works of man. In every product of human art are dead materials. Dead materials are fashioned and united to accomplish a given end. But the organized works of nature are animated by a living principle. They are fashioned, as it were, from out without. In other words, they grow. They are not constructed. In this respect, there's a great difference between a house and a tree or a human body. But nevertheless, in both cases, the mind is external to the thing produced. Because the end, the thought, is prior to the product. As the thought or idea of a machine must be in the mind of the mechanic before the machine is made. It is a simple and pregnant conclusion, says Trendelberg, that so far as design is realized in the world, thought as its ground has preceded it. And this thought, he goes on to say, is not dead as a figure or model. It is connected with will and power. It is therefore in the mind of the person who has the ability and purpose to carry it out. As the conviction, the design implies an intelligent agent is intuitive and necessary. It is not limited to the narrow sphere of our experience. <clears throat> Now for Prof. Raymond, as we switch gears from the existence of God to his eternal decrees as the living God. He's been talking about Romans 9, the hated chapter by many. So we pick up with that exposition of Romans 9, I believe. Because Paul recognized that the degree, however small, which an individual is allowed to be the decisive factor in receiving and working out the subjective benefits of grace for his transformation. He tracked in the same proportion from the monergism of the divine grace and reality of the glory of God. Now that's a long sentence. It could be broken up into simpler, more cognizable units. Paul calls attention to God's sovereign discrimination between man and man to place the proper emphasis on the proof that his grace alone, God's grace, is the source of all spiritual good to be found in man. Which is just to say that if God did choose the way he did, out of the infinite depth of the riches of his wisdom and knowledge, Romans 11.33, in order to be able to manifest his grace, Romans 9, 11, that he did not choose arbitrarily or capriciously. In other words, the condition governing the reason for his choosing the way he did did not lie in the creature. Indeed, from the very nature of the case, the condition could not lie in the creature. If it did, the creature would be the determining agent in salvation and become thereby, for all intents and purposes, the human creature would be God. If there was a wise reason in himself for choosing the way he did, and there was, namely that he might make room for the exhibition of his grace as alone the, the source of all spiritual good in men, then he did not choose capriciously. The 
course, there may be many other grounds for election unknown and unknowable to us, it is true. But as Voss reminds us, quote, this one reason we do know, and in knowing that we at the same time know that whatever other reasons exist, they can have nothing to do with any meritorious ethical condition of the objects of God's choice. Number 15, he's going through the reasons in the New Testament for God's eternal decrees. In another context, Paul writes, by God's doing you are in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1.30, which effectual work he views as the outworking of divine election 123 to 28. Number 16 in this long list of New Testament citations, Paul enunciated God's sovereignty and predestination of men under the adoption as sons in the doxological form in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, which we'll read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, so that, with the result that, we should be holy and blameless before him in love. In love, he predestinated us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself, according to the intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestinated according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will in order that we might be for the praise of his glory. We've got a couple more reasons from the New Testament that he will give next time. We shift from election before the foundation of the world. We shift to the final state at the end of the world and the beginning of the new heavens and new earth. And he's talking here about the state of the wicked, the final state, before he takes on and discusses the final state of the righteous in the new heavens and the new earth. Back to the wicked. It is impossible to determine precisely what will constitute the eternal punishment of the wicked, and it behooves us to speak very cautiously on this subject. Positively, it may be said, A, the total absence of the favor of God. B, an endless disturbance of life as the result of the complete domination of sin. C, positive pains of suffering in body and soul. Now, the resurrection has occurred, and body and soul now are dispatched to eternal life, eternal death. B, such subjective punishments as pangs of conscience, anguish, despair, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. It's a bunch of verses. Evidently, there will be degrees of punishment of the wicked, this follows from passages as Matthew 11, 22, Luke 12, 47, and 20, 17. Their punishment will be commensurate with their sinning against the light that they had received. This is plainly stated in Scripture. But even so, it is never it will be eternal punishment for them. Some deny that there will be a literal fire because this could not affect spirits like Satan and his demons. But how do we know this? Our body certainly works on our soul in some mysterious way. There will be some positive punishment corresponding to our bodies. 
It is undoubtedly true, however, that a great deal of the language concerning heaven and hell must be understood figuratively. Number three, the duration of this punishment. The question of the eternity of the future punishment deserves more special consideration, however, because it is so frequently denied. It is said that the words used in scripture for everlasting and eternal may simply denote an age or a dispensation or any other long period of time. Now, it cannot be doubted that they are so used in some passages, but this does not prove that they always have the limited meaning. This is why we study original languages for theological students to go back into the original texts and do lexical and theological surveys. It is not the literal meaning of these terms. Whenever they are so used, they are used figuratively. And in such cases, their figurative use is generally quite evident from the connection. Moreover, there are positive reasons for thinking that these words do not have a limited meaning, meaning in the passages to which we've referred. A. Matthew 25, 46 the same word describes the duration of both, the bliss of the saints and the penalty of the wicked. If the latter is not, properly speaking, unending, neither is the former. And yet many of those who doubt eternal punishment do not doubt eternal life. B. Other expressions are used which cannot be set aside by the consideration mentioned in the preceding. The fire of hell is called an unquenchable fire, Mark 9.43. And it is said of the wicked that their worm dieth not, Mark 9.48. Moreover, the gulf that will separate saints and sinners in the future is said to be fixed and impassable. Luke 16, 26. And now we'll make our start as he shifts attention from the wicked to the final state of the righteous. The new creation will be his first point. The second will be the eternal abode of the righteous and then the nature of their reward. The final state of believers will be preceded by the passing of the present world and the appearance of the new creation. Matthew 19, 28 speaks of the regeneration and Acts 3, 21, the restoration of all things. We'll pick that up in our next segment. And now we're just ending an article on the high priest In post-exilic times, it will be after the Babylonian conquest of Judah and Israel by Nebuchadnezzar and his forces. The high priest was the head of the Jewish state as well as the principal religious figure. At first, the office may have been for life and hereditary, but under Antiochus Epiphanes, that would be after Alexander the Great and the splitting of the Greek kingdom into four parts and he was one of the Seleucids of Syria and second century BC the successors of the high priest the appointment and deposition of high priests passed more and more to the authority of secular powers so that by the time of the Herods and the Roman occupation, the high priests were usually taken from the most influential families. They seem to have been to have professed a materialistic creed, believing neither in the immortal soul nor future life. And according to the Talmud, they lived in worldliness and luxury. The high priest. 
was responsible for, partly responsible for, at the trial of our sovereign redeemer. We turn now to um, the story, Shaft's account of Paul's missionary labors. We'll make our start on that. The public life of Paul from the third year after his conversion to his martyrdom, he dates it, the conversion at 40 AD. I have been in years past of the opinion that Paul was converted in 37 AD. But, um, then if you throw three years at, on his conversion when he went into Arabia, then 40 A.D. makes sense here on Shaft's telling. And he also has Paul dying in 64 A.D., which I have questions about thinking maybe it's 66 or 67 A.D. We soldier on. He gives 40 to 64 here. Embraces a quarter of a century. Three great missionary campaigns with minor expeditions five visits to Jerusalem, and at least four years of captivity in Palestinian Caesarea Palestine and Rome. Some extend his death to 67 or 68. It may be divided into five or six periods as follows. The first period we start from 40 to 44 A.D., the period of preparatory labors in Syria and his native Cilicia, partly alone, partly in connection with Barnabas, his senior fellow apostle among the Gentiles. On his return from the Arabian retreat, Paul began his public ministry in earnest at Damascus, preaching Christ on the very spot where he had been converted and called. His testimony enraged the Jews, who stirred up the deputy of the king of Arabia against him. But he was saved for future usefulness, and let down by the brethren in a basket through a window in the wall of the city. Three years after his conversion, he went up to Jerusalem to make the acquaintance of Peter and spend a fortnight with him. Now for slavery in the medieval period, 590 to 1049. The church exerted her great moral power not so much towards the abolition of slavery as the amelioration or removal of the evils from it. Many provincial synods dealt with the subject, at least incidentally. The legal right of holding slaves was never called into question and slaveholders were in good and regular standing. Even convents held slaves, though in glaring inconsistency with their professed principle of equality and brotherhood. Pope Gregory the Great, 590 to 604 as Pope, one of the most humane of the popes, presented bond servants from his own estates to convents and exerted all his influence to recover a fugitive slave of his brother. A reform synod of Pavia, over which Benedict VIII, one of the forerunners of Hildebrand, presided 1018, enacted that sons and daughters of clergymen, whether from free women or slaves, whether from legal wives or concubines, are the property of the church and should never be emancipated. No pope has ever declared slavery incompatible with Christianity. The church was strongly conservative and never encouraged a revolutionary or radical movement towards universal emancipation. But on the other hand, the Christian spirit worked silently, steadily, and irresistibly in the direction of emancipation. We turn to Calvin. 
and he has just finished up. Well, we're talking about his marriage and home life now. And he's in Strasbourg when he will finally marry Italette. He himself was in no hurry to get married and put it off till he was over 30. He rather boasted that people could not charge him with having assailed Rome as the Greeks besieged Troy for the sake of a woman. What led him first to think of it was the sense of loneliness and the need of proper care that he might be able better to serve the church. He had a housekeeper with her son, a woman of violent temper who sorely tried his patience. At one time she abused his brother so violently that he left the house, and then she ran away, leaving her son behind. The disturbance made him sick. He was often urged by his friend Farrell, who himself had no time to think of marrying until his old age, and by Booser, encouraged him to take a wife, that he might enjoy the comforts of a well-ordered home. He first mentions the subject in a letter to Farrell from Strasbourg, May 19, 1539, in which he says, I am none of those insane lovers who, when once smitten with the fine figure of a woman, embrace also her faults. This only is the beauty which allures me, if she be chaste, obliging, obliging, not fastidious, economical, patient, and careful for my health. There, if you think well of it, set out immediately, lest someone else gets the start of you. But if you think otherwise, we will let it pass. And it seems Farrell could not find a person that combined all these qualities, and the matter was dropped for several months. In February 6, 1540, Calvin, in a letter to the same friend, Farrell, touched again upon the subject of matrimony, but only incidentally, as if it were a subordinate matter. After informing him about his trouble with Caroli, his discussion with Herman, an Anabaptist, the good understanding of Charles V and Francis I, and the alarm of the Protestant princes of Germany, he goes on to say, Nevertheless, in the midst of such commotions, I am so much at my ease as to have the audacity to think of taking a wife. A certain damsel of noble rank has been proposed to me, and with fortune above my condition. Two considerations deterred me from that connection, because she did not understand our language, and because I feared she might be too mindful of her family and her education. And on towards Cranmer. And we pick up here on the discussion of the Reformed Church. And was it a Reformed Church? And if so, when? Prof. Mack is doing some back channeling here on the connections between Cranmer and the Continent. Nevertheless, we can already discern in the Strasbourg St. Gall chain of the 1530s the distinctive outlines of reformations which would converge later under the spell of Calvin's person, powerful personality. The reforming leaders of these communities kept closely in touch, monitored their always delicate relationships with secular authorities and scented out the possibilities of extending the work of godliness elsewhere, place by place, as had already happened piecemeal in Switzerland. England hardly looked promising territory for them with its centralized Tudor government, its lack of self, civic self-assertion, and the opinionated royal monarch but they boasted one great asset, 
the friendship established between two humanist scholars, Simon Grenaeus and Cranmer, that went back to 1531, which in turn, when Grenaeus was in England at the time, which in turn had produced the first correspondence between Thomas Cranmer and Martin Bucer of Strasbourg. This was the basis of an ambitious and multifaceted plan of alliance between the evangelicals of Central Europe and England in the years after 1535, and after Cranmer had been archbishop for two years. To trace the interweaving of this plan will reveal just how closely the evangelicals of the Strasbourg St. Gall Swiss network cooperated as they approached Archbishop of Canterbury, the primate of all England. The background was the mood of excited optimism among European evangelicals who were inspired by Henry VIII's new approach to the Lutheran princes of the Schmalkaldic League in autumn of 1535. It was the ministers of Strasbourg led by Martin Bucer who took the first initiative to widen contacts between the English Lutheran axis. Ironically, the main trigger for their action was Stephen Gardner of all things with his publication De Vera Obedientia Fox and Heath almost certainly provided copies from the London print run of this crucial piece of anti-papal propaganda and was Steve Gardner's effort to curry favor with Henry VIII. When they consulted with the Strasbourg religious establishment on their way to northern Germany, and the result was remarkable in fall. 1535. The new Strasbourg printing of the book with a gushing preface by the ministers Capito, Hedio, and Brobuser. How ironic. A gushing preface in to St Stephen Gardner's volume who will become viciously anti Cranmer and anti Reformational. This lavished praise on Gardner's many virtues, <laughs> which Booser would have caused to regret the future. More accurately, from an evangelical point of view, it spoke admiringly of Ambassadors Fox and Heath, <clears throat> and in the goodness of God in providing England with a model archbishop in Thomas Cranmer. Quote, a primate extraordinary as a man in holiness of life, in doctrine, perseverance, and zeal for the government of the church. Quote, close quote. Booser's intention of making this open letter the launch pad for the continent-wide evangelical alliance embracing England was spelled out on January 17, 1536 in a letter to Vadianus in St. Gaul, trying to rouse him to equal enthusiasm and in closing the oration of the English bishop, probably already printed in the Strasbourg edition, Bosser, the enthusiast and compromiser. Turn to confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Westminster Confession, Chapter 10, Paragraph 3. Elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth. So also are all other elect persons capable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word. And now we turn to the formula of concord and the predestination debate among the Lutherans. And now we get to the Jerome Zanke. Zanke is 1516 to 1590. A converted Italian and pupil of Peter Martyr became his successor of professor of theology at Strasbourg in 1553. He was one of the most learned Calvinistic divines of the age and labored for some time with great acceptance. He taught that in, in the Eucharist, Christ's bo true body is broken for us and his blood shed for us are received in the sacrament, but not with the mouth and teeth, but by faith consequently only by believers. This was approved by his superiors since the communion was not Kibis Ventris said Mentis in the same view as had been taught by Bucer, Pepito, Hedio, Zell, and Martyr. He opposed ubiquity and the use of images in the churches. He taught unconditional predestination and its consequence the perseverance of the saints in full harmony as he believed with Augustine, Luther, and Bucer. He reduced his ideas to four sentences. The elect receive from God the gift of true saving faith only once. Two, faith once received can never be totally nor finally lost, partly on account of God's promise, partly on account of Christ's intercession, Three, in every elect believer there are two men, the external and the internal. If he sins, he sins according to the external, but against the internal man. Consequently, he sins not with the whole heart and will. For when Peter denied Christ, this confession of Christ died in his mouth, but not his faith in his heart. Several years before Zanke's call to Strasbourg, a Lutheran countercurrent had been set in motion, which ultimately prevailed. It was controlled by John Marbach, 1521 to 1581. A little man with a large beard, incessant activity, intolerant and domineering spirit, who'd been called from Gina to the pulpit of Strasbourg, 1545. Inferior in learning, he was superior to Zanke in executive ability and popular eloquence. He delighted to be called superintendent and used his authority to the best advantage. He abolished Bucer's catechism and introduced Luther's, taught the ubiquity of Christ's body, undermined the authority of the Tetrapolitan Confession, crippled the Church of French re Refugees, to which Calvin had once ministered, weakened the discipline, introduced pictures into the churches, including those of Luther, and began to republish at Strasbourg the fierce polemical book of Hesychius, Hesychius on the Eucharist. This brought on the controversy. With our infallible list friends, we turn to paragraph 655 to 658. Finally, Christ's resurrection and the risen Christ himself is the principle and source of our future resurrection. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Whereas in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The risen Christ lives in the hearts of his faithful while they await that fulfillment. In Christ, Christians have tasted the powers of the age to come. 
and their lives are swept up by Christ into the heart of divine life. In brief, faith in the resurrection has as its object an event which is historically attested to by the disciples who really encountered the risen one. At the same time, the event is mysteriously transcendent insofar as it is the entry of Christ's humanity into the glory of God. 657, the empty tomb and linen clothes lying there signify in themselves that by God's power, Christ's body had escaped the bonds of death and corruption. They prepared the disciples to encounter the risen Lord. 658, Christ, the firstborn from the dead, is the principle of our own resurrection, even now by the justification of our souls, and one day by the new life he will impart to our bodies. Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. Lord have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, Lord have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save them that rule and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us but thou only. O God, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. O God, the King of glory, who hast exalted thine Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph into the kingdom of heaven, we beseech thee to leave us not comfortless, but to send thy Holy Spirit to teach and instruct our hearts, to comfort and guide, to correct, and elevate and exalt us to the same place where Jesus Christ exists and sits, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Ghost, thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and the lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we surely trusting in thy defense may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our almighty God, almighty and everlasting God, who safely brought us to the beginning of this day, Defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, by thy correction, by thy sanctification, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty Father, whose kingdom is everlasting, we beseech thee of thy mercy to direct and prosper the consultations of those who lead in this nation, that you may give belief, humility, correction of heart, and that they may lead with true religion and piety, truth and justice, for the sake of our children and grandchildren. For the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone works great marvels, send down upon our bishops and those committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may please thee pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pause to remember those with special needs, spoken and unspoken, for David, for Donnie, for Dave who lost his wife, for Joyce who lost her mother, for Linda facing medical issues, for Bob. 
about in his studies. Now for unspoken requests. <coughs> Almighty and everlasting God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. Let's promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant the requests. Fulfill now, Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them. Granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, correction of our hearts, and in the life to come, life everlasting. Amen. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here ends the order for morning prayer, daily for a dear. Godspeed.